Okay, so the information that you'll be inputting into the annual report for the grant schedule is the information that is needed for the CEFA schedule. Our IT department will be running a macro and from this information produce the CEFA schedule. And that's just the way we do it right now for your financial statements. And like the financial statements, you will be attesting to the completeness and the accuracy of the CEFA schedule. It is your schedule. Um, and again, I don't want you to get confused by grant schedule versus CEFA. I'm just trying to get that distinction to you. Now, I know some of you are saying, yeah, but uh, earlier this year when I was doing the annual report for uh, the grant schedule for the annual report, I was inputting information for all kinds of grants because that was what we had told you to do. It didn't matter if it was federal or state that you inputted all the information. And that's true, and it's something we were using to see if it was helpful uh, for making risk assessments, uh, to ensure that we gathered all the grant information. And remember, the gateway system really is kind of a work in process. Um, we'll say that after that, after this earlier this year, we determined that asking for all of the grant information, whether it was federal monies or state or from some other source, was actually confusing to what we needed for an end product. And that it didn't really help give us real helpful, informa real helpful information. So I want to emphasize right now that the information for the annual report grant schedule will be federal only. It might be direct from the feds or more than likely it's going to be indirect from the state or another governmental unit and some of you from not-for-profits every now and then will get some money. So it'll either be the direct or indirect what's passed through to you but it will just be the federal dollars. Another change from this last annual report is that the question, you remember there's a series of questions that you're asked when you start doing the um, annual report, like is this a, um, what unit of government, um, and one of the questions was, uh, let's see, in regard to grants, it asks, did your unit disperse more than $400,000 from grants? And if you said yes, then you had to populate the grant schedule. For this next annual report, the question will ask you, did you disperse money from grants, period. That's, it does not have a dollar limit now. So it means federal dollars again. And I will guarantee you that there's not any county here that has not dispersed at least a dollar in federal funds of some sort. So that means everybody is going to be filling out that grant schedule. And when I was talking to our IT people, they even thought that they might, and it depends on whether they can do it or not, they might not even make it an option for counties. But irregardless, so you'll know that that question, if it's there, then you're going to have to answer yes. There have been um, changes to the annual report with the addition of two additional columns asking for more information. Now, in addition to the disbursements, you will also um, have to provide the receipts. And you will identify the grant activity as either an advance or a reimbursement basis grant. And the other areas to populate really haven't changed. So we'll go over these briefly and then concentrate on the disbursements and receipts and advances and reimbursements and show how that these amounts and information result in your CEFA. Um, I'd really like to pull up an example of the gateway and show you how this is all flowing through, but these changes I'm talking about haven't been made to the system yet. They will be made before um, year end, so unfortunately I know it's always best to see, but you'll just have to use your 
imaginations here a little bit. Um, you will have the local project name, and that is the name used to locally identify the project for uh, many grants. This would be the same name as the formal grant name, but may differ, especially if trying to more um, clearly identify the lo local project. Next is the federal program title project name. Let's see, I think I'm a little off schedule here, so let me catch up on this. Yeah. Makes more sense with what I'm saying, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I have little clicks here, and I think I missed a click. <laughs> okay, next is the federal program title or project name. This is the official program title from which the grant was awarded. And this again should come from your, do, uh, your grant document. Federal agency. This would be the federal agency that awarded you the grant directly or if it's a pass through to you, the federal agency should be named in your award document. And if it isn't, we went over this in the spring, and especially if it already has the CFDA, no, CFDA number provided, the first two numbers will indicate which federal agency originally awarded the grant. And remember, CFDA stands for Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. And we provided you with a listing of CFDA numbers in the spring. So once again, if you um, need to, you can go to um, our meeting materials and pull that information off. You'll need to identify the pass-through agency. Here you enter the name of the state agency or other entity that awarded the grant when it was not awarded directly to you by the feds. Do not use an acronym, but use the full name. So if it's DCS, don't use DCS for child support, use Department of Child Services. Um, Remember, the information that you're inputting into this system is going to go to the CEFA schedule. And so on that CEFA schedule, we want the full name on there. Because that's only going to make sense to the feds. They don't know what DCS means. So they, they need to have that information in full. See the CFDA number? This is the number from the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance that identifies a federal grant program. Again, if the grant involves federal funds, the CFDA number should be identified in your award letter. And again, if the award letter does not identify the funding source, do not assume that it's from the state and doesn't and doesn't say federal funding that it's a state fund. Don't, don't make that assumption. I would call, more often than not, we're talking about federal funding of some, some way or another. So I'd call that state agency and make sure. Now if it says state, state grant some way, then that's fine. But most, a lot of times they, they might not identify it. So you really need to make sure. If the award indicates that it's a combination of state and federal, but it's not clear as to the percentage, you need to find out from the awarding agency and request that they provide you with documentation letting you know what the percentages are. It's very important that you know what percentage the money that they're passing down to you is federal and state. So again, um, make sure that you contact them about that. You'll need the award number. This is the number that the awarding agency has assigned to your grant. This should be in the award letter again, but some do not have an award number, such as Title IV-D. Um, and if that's the case, then you'll just leave this blank. And likewise, with award name, sometimes they just maintain whatever the federal program name is. They don't have a separate name. And if that's the case, that's fine. Just um, 
leave that blank. Local fund number, name, of course that's your county fund and number that you um, have received and dispersed the monies from. Amount of federal awards provided by the county to subrecipients during the year. Um, that's another bit of information that you'll have to give. This should not exceed the total disbursements reported for the program. Believe it or not, we've had that where they've had more pass-through monies than what federal dollars have been that they've received. So what this is telling you is that there might be some other monies that are mixed in there. So you need to look into why that you're thinking you were able to pass more dollars down. Um, again, we went over the difference between what a subrecipient is versus a service provider in the spring, and we uh, provided you some materials that give you the distinctions between the two that the uh, feds uh, have passed out. And again, that, that will be um, on the website, that's on our website under the meeting materials for last spring. Um, if you have uh, loans outstanding at year end, you'll be inputting that information. This is somewhat unusual to have. Uh, economic development is one of the loans made from the feds that we do see occasionally. Again, it should be very evident in your agreement. Amount of federal non-cash assistance for the year. This could be something like immunization, Im immunization shots, um, this you would put on at the fair market value at the time of receipt. And then this last one is amount of insurance in effect during the year. This is a federal assistance provided to assure reimbursement for losses sustained under specified conditions. Um, I could not find any examples of this. I asked and nobody could provide this to me, so I don't think that this is something that you really have to worry about, but you need to know that it's there. But again, it would be very clear in any agreement that you had. So again, other than um, about the receipts, disbursements, advance reimbursements, which we'll get to here in a moment, nothing else is really new than what you've already been providing. Now to disbursements, which that sounds pretty straightforward, and it is. Um, what you've really been inputting already into the annual report grant schedule. Um, but the disbursement that you have for the annual report grant schedule and what it is on the CFA are probably going to be different, and you really need to understand why. Uh, remember again, the CFA is something you're going to be attesting to. So, um, I want you to really have a clear understanding of what it is that you're attesting to. So the instructions to the annual report for disbursements is what you would expect. They say enter the amount of federal grant funds that have been dispersed for the period being reported. They also say enter only the amount of federal funds dispersed. Do not include any matching funds. So that's, that's easy enough. Um, you should have a fund set up separately to account for your financial activity for any grant. And if there's no match, say like in 2012, there were disbursements of 10,000, then 10,000 is what you would input. And if there was a local match of 30%, which you've moved into that fund, then the total disbursements were 10,000, but you would put input into the annual report, $7,000. So, easy, no great mystery there. And there's really no big mystery to the receipt side of it. This in information, new information being required, but again, it's straightforward. The instructions say, enter the amount of federal grant dollars that have been received for the period being reported. So again, you'll only enter the federal funds receipted, and you do not include any matching funds. So, very, very straightforward, and you're like, well, why are you talking to us about this? Well, now we get into a little bit more of the important side. 
the important distinction comes with the other new information that we were talking about that you have to input into the annual uh, report grant schedule. And that's whether or not the grant is an advance or if it's a reimbursement. And you will have to click on one of those two, otherwise it will not allow you to submit the report. Um, the box for advanced grants should be checked when the federal grant is received on an advancement basis. This means that the grant money is received before disbursements are made related to the grant activity. The federal money is actually used to pay for any of the activities related to the grant. The box for reimbursement grants should be checked when the federal grant is received on a reimbursement basis, which is what we're mostly familiar with. This means that the disbursements are made with local funds and then the amount is reimbursed with the federal funds. And again, I can't stress enough that it's really important that you, collect, that you click on the right one in that box. This is because this will let you know whether it is the disbursement that is identified as the federal expenditure on the CFA report or the receipt is the, is the amount that's identified as the federal expenditure. So that's going to be a little bit confusing here. Depending on whether the grant is an advance or if it's a reimbursement, Either the receipts are identified as the federal expenditures or the disbursements are identified as the federal expenditure. For advanced grants on the CEFA, the expenditures equal the disbursements that occurred for the period. What is reflected in your fund activity as a disbursement will be reflected on the CEFA schedule as total federal awards expended. For a reimbursement grant, the amount shown on the CEFA schedule as total federal awards expended is the amount received as reimbursement for the same time period. And this is really a more conservative approach as what you've dispersed up front with your local funds and then re request as a reimbursement may not be fully reimbursed. There are situations where it's determined when you request that reimbursement that it's unallowable, so they don't send you the money. Or it could be that you've surpassed your award amount for some reason. Again, you don't get reimbursed. You're, the county's left holding the bag. And that would not be federal funds that would be reported on the CFA. So, the more, conservative report, re, the more conservative method for that is to report the receipts for reimbursement on the CEFA report. So that's why you'll see it that way. <clears throat> so anyway, this is a distinction that has been made and why it's very important to check the correct box on your annual report grant schedule. And this is also why that receipts were added as part of the annual report grant schedule information. Because otherwise, it would be just left up to you to just sit there and go, okay, which was that again? Do I put receipts under disbursements or do I put disbursements under disbursements? Which, you know, would give me a headache, so I can just imagine. And again, this allowed us to be able to create that macro based on the information that you give this. So all of this sounds pretty straightforward, a little confusing, but straightforward. And I think that for many of the grants, that's true. But for others, the details um, show it can be a little bit confusing because you've got that state match that can be thrown in there. So we're going to go over some examples. And really, it's going to be one example. <laughs> it's going to be Title IV-D. Um, I will have to say that if you can get, everybody has Title IV-D, and if you can get Title IV-D down, you can get 
anything down. I mean, it, 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 boggles, it boggles our field examiners' minds. So I will let you know that. I know that Cynthia has spent, Cynthia Longus has worked with you very hard to explain what child support Title IV-D monies are and what they can be expended. And um, I will say that are, there are many parts to the funding of this program. And the feds have appeared to allow for several creative ways for federal dollars to flow from the state to the local government. And truthfully, I think the fed, that the state has utilized every single one of them. So let's uh, kind of go over some of these funding mechanisms. Um, for starters, there is the basic reimbursement for direct and indirect Title IV-D costs. Here, the county upfronts these costs. They, um, then you will fill out and submit the form detailing these costs as required by DCS. Then the state EFTs the money to you. And right away, um, every time you try to come up with an example, there's always going to be an exception. Uh, I know that in this particular case, that for the direct and indirect Title IV-D, that is not maintained in a separate grant fund. This is only one that I'm aware of that this happens, but I know a lot of times the money is spent through the um, general fund or can be through the prosecutors. There, there's a few different funding mechanisms that, um, you, that are used for this. So once again, if you, do it with, if you can get this with Title IV-D, then all's going to be good. Um, so obviously, you're tracking the direct and the indirect costs. Disbursements probably as a line item through one of these, um, and again, I know that's going to vary from county to county. Those disbursements that occur during the calendar year will be what you put onto the annual report grant schedule uh, for the REIT seat side, and here's the important thing. Uh, when you get money from the state, you will also receive remittance advices from the auditor of state. And here's an example of one in your schedule. Um, and this is really important because while it's important that you maintain these remittance, the remittances that you actually receive from DCS are the more critical of the two. The auditor's state remittances do not have the detail that is provided in the DCS remittances. And as you can see on this one here, the auditor state remittance provides a total that states it's for the prosecutors, clerks, and court, but it does not break down the amounts between them. And that detail is very critical in determining what is federal versus state funding for a portion of these reimbursements. And remember, since this is a reimbursement grant, it is the receipt amounts that will be carried over as your total federal award expended. So let's break this down and go over DCS's remittance advices. Uh, first of all, DCS will send to you a separate remittance advice for direct and indirect costs. Reimbursement for indirect costs is 100% federal. And as you can see, it's really straightforward. You know, it tells you it's from DCS. Um, it also says that it's for indirect costs and provides other things like the CFDA number, which is nice for it to indicate. It also has your county name. So, and then it will say on here what quarter the reimbursement is for. Um, now, some counties do not request reimbursement on a timely basis, and I strongly encourage you to do so. But if you haven't, there might be some rather old quarters. And remember, you're on a cash basis, so you rece receipt these funds when they're received. So in other words, you're going to kind of ignore that because you are going to receipt the money when you've actually 
received it, and that's what's going to be reflected on your grant schedule, not what the quarter it's for. We're not in an accrual basis. On a direct cost reimbursement, you can expect to see reimbursement to the clerks, courts, and prosecutors, though all three may not be included at the same time. The amounts indicated on the remittance for the reimbursement of direct costs to the clerks and courts are always 100% federal. This is not so for the prosecutors. You'll note on this remittance advice, next to the prosecutors, there is a capital F in parens, and there's a, and I've got an arrow pointing to it. This indicates that this amount is for 100% federal. And we'll see in a moment what one looks like that is not 100% federal. At the top, you notice that this, uh, the CFDA number is, is indicated, but it also has something saying regular FFP reimbursement. What FFP means is that the state is reimbursing 100% of the 66 federal share of Title IV-D. And so when you see that notation of FFP reimbursement, you can really be pretty sure that the dollars here are 100% federal. This next remittance is indicating, again, for clerks, courts, and prosecutors, um, but in this case, only the prosecutors are being reimbursed. You'll, you'll note that there is no FFP reimbursement that's noted up there. And down below, um, you'll see next to the prosecutor a parens with a capital C in it. This means that only 66% of the amount indicated is federal. The rest of the reimbursement is state dollars. So only 66% of this would be, dis would be disbursement on your grant schedule. Uh, I can t I'll tell you a little bit why this is happening, and again, this is for the prosecutors only. Up to a certain dollar amount for each county, the prosecutor will be reimbursed for 100% of their costs by the state, and no county share is required. And until that threshold is met, the reimbursements sent by the state to the county are made up of 66% federal dollars and 34% state dollars. Once that threshold is met, the state will only send federal dollars, and the county is responsible for 34% match. So, just to repeat, indirect is 100% federal. Direct for courts and clerks are always 100% federal. If there's a capital F next to the prosecutor's line, the reimbursement is 100% federal and all of it would be reflected as a receipt on the grant schedule. If there is a capital C next to the prosecutor's line, only 66% of the amount is federal, so you would reflect only 66% of the amount as a receipt on the grant schedule. You would want to make sure to check the box reimbursement so that the receipts would be reflected on the CIFA report as the federal award expended. Now the incentive funds. You may have up to eight incentive funds as shown here on this slide. And they're not always treated the same when checking off the box as either advance or reimbursement. A few of you, and hopefully very, very few of you, may have prior to October 99 incentive dollars left. Uh, so we'll deal with those first. You may have one or two funds that are reflecting the activity of this money. One is for the clerks and another is for the prosecutors. These are not considered federal dollars for purposes of the grant schedule. So I'm going to tell you how you'll deal with them so that 
It doesn't get reflected on the grant schedule, basically. I mean, you wouldn't break my heart if, if they didn't get reported on the annual report, but I don't want to give you an exception to another exception. So to be consistent, there would only be disbursement dollars here. There should absolutely be no receipts. It's been 1999. That was a long time ago. Um, you input the disbursements but put zero for your receipts, and you would check the box making this reimbursement grant. So that way the CFA will show zero for this. Uh, now we'll talk real quickly about the ARA incentive funds. There are three of these. There's the Title IV-D ARA, the ARA Prosecutor IV-D incentive, and the ARA Clerk IV-D incentive. And you might still have some of these funds still available to you, but you should not have received any new ARA money in 2012. These are considered reimbursement, and so were included on the grant schedule as federal awards expended when they were receipted in. So they've already been taken care of. So even though you might still be spending these dollars, you don't, they would not be reflected on the CIFA report. So for the annual grant schedule, you would input your disbursements for the year, and then because you should receive no receipts for our funding in 2012, you would enter zero. Make sure that you check the box for reimbursement. And this way you'll again be showing no act federal expenditure activity on the CEPA report when the mac macro goes into effect. The other three incentive funds are Title IV-D incentive, Prosecutor Title IV-D incentive, and Clerk Title IV-D incentive, the ones that we're all very familiar with. These three funds are advances. Again, you will input your disbursements and your receipts, and then make sure that you check the box for advance. This way, the disbursement activity will show as the a federal award expenditure on your CEFA report. So, know that's a little messy, but I think if you just go ahead and remember which ones are the advances and which ones are the receipts, you'll get to a CEFA report that clearly reflects what your expenditures are for the year. Now, to confuse things just a little bit more, many of you have a third type of funding stream that I haven't even broached yet, and that is program income. So let me talk about program income quickly here, and then we'll go over 4Ds, program income. Um, Let's start with what is program income. This is the gross income earned by the recipient that is directly generated by supported activity or earned as a result of an award. And this could be income for services, fees for services. Um, it could be property that you've purchased with federal dollars and you've earned some rental income on it. There's many things that it could be. What it is not is any interest that interest income that you've received from investing advanced federal funds that you've received. Not that that would be a real big deal right now, but I just want that's a question that's often asked and no, if you had an advance, any interest income that you receive would not be considered program income. And really, it's not a, that common of an occurrence, and I don't want you to start thinking, okay, is what we're doing with these federal funds generating fees and stuff, and so I have to worry about program income, because the majority of time, you do not. However, since we know that 4D has program income, we need to address it. And there's right now, there's currently at least 37 counties that have this, and it's going to only be an be increasing. Um, and that's why I'm going to train you on it, and you're not going to like me on this. Program income is treated differently on the CEFA. It is not reported on the face of the schedule. 
Rather, it's netted out against the federal expenditures, and it, it's this net figure that is reported on the face of the schedule. So how do you input this into the annual report grant schedule so that it'll come out right in the CEPA schedule? And the truth is that this schedule was not designed to deal with the program income. Um, as I said earlier, we apologize. This was just not something that was thought about. And we will be working to design it for 2014 to deal with it. So in the meantime, uh, we'll provide you with instructions on how best to deal with a 4Ds program income. Um, to give you a little bit, bit, of a, bit of background, there is a statute and is part of the cooperative agreement between prosecutors and DCS where the prosecuting attorney in each county is allowed to contract with a private collection agency or PCA for short to collect their arrears on certain child support cases. The PCA submits directly to DCS monthly the amount that they collect and then based on that collection that DCS receives from the PCA 10% of the collected amount is to go to the prosecutor and 15% of the collected amount is to go to the PCA. DCS disperses both of these amounts to the county and these are both deposited into the fund entitled Prosecutor PCA. The county is then to disperse to the PCA the PCA share and that's not going to be included on the annual uh, report, grant schedule, or the CEPA. Um, and then they make available to the prosecutor the prosecutor share. So let's look at a remittance advice for that. Again, the DCS remittance will be important in letting you know what portion is to be used for the annual report grant and the CEPA. Um, again, we have all the general information. It also clearly states that this is for a PCA fee payment and gives what month of collections the amounts are for. And then it shows the division between the prosecutor's share and the collection agency's share. And for the grant schedule, only the prosecutor's share is considered. And of the prosecutor's share, only 66% is federal. So again, this is going to be one of those deals where it's only a portion is going to actually be reported on your grant schedule. But remember what I said, it's not directly reported on there, right? It's just reflected on there. What you're not going to do is enter any of the activity from this fund into the annual report. Again, the activity for the prosecutor PCA is not to be entered as a separate grant item. What you will need to do is net the total of amount a federal income that you have calculated from the remittance advice and then you will net this against the portion of the grant that is the receipt for the direct cost reimbursement. Remember as reimbursement it is the receipts that are reflected on the federal award expenditure. So by reducing the receipt of the direct cost reimbursement, you're actually reducing the federal award expenditure amount. You will need to document how you have netted this so that somebody else would be able to trace backwards and so that you would be able to trace backwards and know why that there's a difference in this amount. And I, I really wish that there was an easier way to do this. And uh, both Tammy and I talked about it. We tried to think of a different way to deal with it. 
We just could not think of anything. So hopefully this is just a one-year deal with this part of it, but it might not be. It could be that this is just the way that you'll have to deal with program income. So let's re recap. You will not abstract your own CIFA. A macro will be run against the data that you inputted into the annual, re um, annual report grant schedule. You're going to enter both your receipts and your disbursements for each grant. You'll enter only the federal portion of the receipts and disbursements. You must declare whether they are an advance or a reimbursement grant. When advanced, the total expenditures reported on the CIFA will equal the disbursements inputted into the annual report grant schedule. So you would expect to see those matching up. When a reimbursement, the total fund federal expenditures reported on the CIFA will equal the receipts inputted into the annual report grant schedule. And for Title IV-D, direct and indirect costs are on the reimbursement basis. The detailed receipt information is found on the DCS's remittance advices. Indirect costs, clerk direct costs, and court direct costs are 100% federal. Prosecutors direct costs may be 100% federal or 66% federal. The advances, if it's prior to October 99 or ARA, are going to be recorded on the reimbursement basis. They're all 100% federal, what you would put down. Um, and then for post-October 99 incentive funding, it's 100% federal. It is, um, and, that, and so that would be an advance. The prosecutor PCA fund activity is program income, and it's not inputted directly into the grant schedule. It's netted against the direct cost receipts, and that would only be 66%. So I know that's as clear as mud, but I think it's just one of those things as you work through it that it will come to you. Now, I am going to give you a little side hint here about the CIFA report. Um, you should really look at last year's, or this year, what you received this year, um, the CIFA report. I looked and did kind of a comparison between the annual report grant schedule information that was inputted this year and the CIFA reports and they were really night and day. And I know that it was something that you had to get used to, um, but what we want to do in the future is based on what you input into this system, we will roll forward in the future so that you don't have to input this grant schedule information continuously. We won't, we won't roll forward the amounts, but we'll roll forward the information. And then that way, all that you'll have is if you have to take off a grant because it's no longer applicable, or if it's something that's new, then you're going, you would have to add. But otherwise, you're not going to have to continually input that. Um, so when our field examiners come out to see you this next year and they find things that are not there, they are going to require you to make adjustments just like they have for the financial statements. So don't be surprised when they say, well, yeah, we found these adjustments that need to be made, so please go ahead and make them. Know that hopefully in the future that's going to make it easier on all of you. So, uh, hopefully this helps. Um, I keep this PowerPoint by your side when you do do the grant schedule. You know my phone number. You know Tammy's phone number. We're there. We'll, d we'll help you get through it. Um, again, I know it's not just the cleanest thing, and I wish it were, but...